Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depends on where you are in the world today. Welcome to the 35th Emerging Growth Conference. I'm Anna Berry, and I'll be your host. As always, we have an exciting list of companies in a wide range of growth sectors presenting to you today. So just a few notes for those attending. Remember that all of our conferences are uploaded to the Emerging Growth Conference YouTube channel. So subscribe there, check them out, youtube.com slash Emerging Growth Conference. Now, today, when we switch to the next company, you're going to see a black screen for a brief moment, but don't go anywhere. That's just us moving over to the next presenter. But if you do experience downtime for more than a minute or two, just refresh your browser. Our platform does work best on Google Chrome, so if you're watching from an Apple device, you have to hit the play button to start the session. Now, during each company's presentation, you can submit questions through the webcast module, and the presenters will attempt to address as many of these at the end of their presentation. And one last note, after today's event, you'll be redirected to the registration page for our next conference. So stay on or come back to reserve your spot early. Without further ado, I want to introduce our first company. We have Splash Beverage Group. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange American under the symbol SBEV and is an innovator in the beverage industry, which owns a growing portfolio of alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverage brands, including Copa de Vino wine, By the Glass, salt-flavored tequilas, Pulpo Loco, Sangria, and Tap Out Performance Hydration and Recovery Drink. Please welcome its president and CEO, Robert Nestico. Welcome, Robert. Thank you, Anna. Great to be here this morning. All right. We look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. Welcome, everybody. And I appreciate everyone joining us this morning and listening to uh, our story. Uh, I'll get right into it here. As you know, uh, forward-looking statements uh, have to be uh, acknowledged by all, all viewers. <laughs> um, I think you all have seen enough of these. I don't have to read it line by line. Uh, a little bit about the history of Splash. Um, as Anna said, we are uh, NYSC American SBEV. We did Uplist uh, approximately uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, we uh, are very, very busy growing our, uh, organic, our legacy portfolio organically, uh, while we also look for uh, potential acquisition targets as well. Um, it's a very, very important uh, sort of dual uh, pla uh, path to growth for us. So organic growth and acquisition, very important. Our team, we'll get into in a moment, um, our executive management team and our board, we believe are second to none. Uh, and um, uh, we'll get into some numbers here right now so everybody can uh, get a good feel for the company. Um, like I said, SBEV, um, actually our share price, uh, I think yesterday we closed uh, closer to 306, uh, so our market cap's a little bit higher, um, and our average trading daily uh, daily trading volume, excuse me, uh, is right around a little over a million, uh, about 37 million shares outstanding, almost 38 actually, and our balance sheet is in good shape. <clears throat> From a revenue standpoint, uh, we keep experiencing quarter over quarter record growth. Uh, Q, <clears throat> Q1 grew um, at 86% over uh, the previous quarter. And as we uh, uh, prepare for our, our uh, reporting in August for Q2, um, we'll see where we are, but uh, no reason to expect anything different. Um, really four platforms here for us. Our, our, any business needs, uh, needs these things, but we're keenly focused on this. Our management team uh, and our board are industry leaders, uh, second to none. Um, our distribution is exceptionally important in beverage. Um, it, it sounds like a commonsensical thing, but you'd be surprised how many people miss that. Uh, if you're not on the shelf, you're not for you're not for sale. If we could have Anna and Robert's uh, uh, iced tea or or tequila, but it's not there. It's not for sale. Nobody cares. Uh, our core values, um, really, there are three: pre-existing brand awareness, which makes our job a lot easier. People already heard of brands like Tap Out, um, then they see it on the shelf on a on a major retailer like Walmart, for example, uh, it's instant credibility. So that pre-existing brand awareness is very important. And then, and or pure innovation. In the case of our tequila, um, there are so many flavors out there, right? No one's done it really well or hardly at all for, uh, for uh, in the tequila segment. So we have flavored tequila. So we consider that pure innovation uh, with, uh, with the safety net, right? People already understand and love tequila and they love flavors. So it makes sense to marry those two things together. Uh, and then, of course, industry growth through acquisition and the right timing is, is critically important. 
um, you know, the, uh, the beverage business, it's massive, um, 1.5 trillion uh, in valuation at this point. Uh, in the next several years, people expect, um, uh, the analysts are expecting this thing to go actually go over 2 trillion, certainly 1.8 by 2024. There have been so many exits um, um, in this space. And the nice thing about the beverage space, I believe tech does this as well, but um, when you exit in beverage, it's, it's on a multiple of top line revenue, not EBITDA. So in the case of Coca-Cola, they paid, this is a while back, but they paid $4.2 billion for, for vitamin water. Um, so, you know, uh, on a number of over, over enterprise value. So it's a, it's a fun space. A lot of people want to be in it uh, for this reason, for sure. Uh, so tons of exits out there. Uh, we'll get into some examples here in the next slide. Um, you probably remember some of these. Uh, Dr. Pepper Snapple, which is now cured Dr. Pepper, bought by for $1.7 billion. Of course, everybody knows about George Clooney and Randy Gerber selling Casa Amigos for a billion dollars. That was 20 times enterprise value. Uh, I don't expect to see a lot of high numbers like that out there. George Clooney is George Clooney. I wish I was George Clooney. Uh, but we, um, uh, we, we, we really don't expect to see multiples like that. A good average out there is somewhere between five, seven, eight times uh, top line revenue. D. Betty, Bolt House Farms, and of course, Vitamin Water. And there have been <clears throat> umpteen exits since this, uh, but these are kind of the most notable. Um, a little bit about our management team, which we're very, very proud of. Um, I, my background is all beverage, uh, and a little bit of private equity. Uh, I started my career with Gallo, ran through the whole system. Uh, uh, I, I left Gallo, I did the unthinkable and I left Gallo. I went to work for Diageo. Uh, I was the number three person at Republic National RNDC distribution, uh, which is the second largest distrib distribution company in the country. Uh, came back to Diageo um, and then left and went to Red Bull. Uh, we started Red Bull from scratch in the Americas. Uh, we went from zero to about 1.6 billion in annual turnover. Uh, pretty proud of that. That's important because it developed a lot of really strong relationships for us moving forward. Uh, did another quick uh, project with uh, Bob Marley's family and got that to about 40 million in revenue very quickly. Um, Bill Meisner, our president, uh, has the same same pedigree. He's he's been president and CEO of many companies. You know, uh, from Sweet from Sparkling Ice, actually physically developed that himself with Talking Rain. Uh, uh, Sobe, um, you name it, uh, did Nas and also Sweet Leaf Tea. Bill is a prince of a man, and we're honored to have him aboard. Um, he um, uh, is a tremendous partner and also a chief marketing officer. Uh, I'm skipping over Sanji for the moment. Aida Aragon, also um, a tigress. I wish we could. I wish we could clone her. She is our SVP of national accounts uh, in front of every national and regional chain in the country with her and her team doing a fantastic job. I have to be careful what I say here uh, as we're moving forward, but she is um, she is very effective. I'll say it that way. Uh, and then uh, Ron Wall joined us just recently. He was the CFO for William Grant, uh, managing one and a half billion dollars of finance in 50 countries. Uh, very, very proud to have Ron on board as well. Uh, Ron and Bill uh, and Aida really running the business uh, along with uh, uh, with my uh, uh, cheering on the side, if you will. Um, Ron is a tremendous uh, uh, addition to the to the executive management team. <clears throat> Pardon me, uh, Sanjeev Javia. I save him for last on this. Um, he's a salaried employee, but he's also an independent contractor. Jeevers is a savant when it comes to formulation. He really built the tap out form uh, formula, but. He's really, really uh, considered probably top five nutritionists in the country. The man is uh, uh, incredible. Uh, he's written 600 nutritional plans for professional Olympic athletes across, uh, across the Americas. And why that's important is when we are at arm's reach with tap out, people like you name it. He was roommates with Tom Brady, by the way, all through his undergrad. They're still very, very good friends. Um, uh, you know, you name it from a Phil Mickelson in golf or Kurt Warner, name an athlete. And Jeevers has written a nutritional plan. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that because when the time comes, we can turn that on and people will tweet and Instagram for us and it costs us absolutely nothing. Uh, we are putting a dream team together to represent Tap Out, by the way. And we'll talk about that here in a little while. Um, so it's a tremendous team. Very, very, very proud of it. Um, our board, uh, we have Peter McDonough, who was the president, chief innovation, and chief marketing officer for Diageo for about a decade. Uh, myself, of course, on the board, on the founder and, and chairman, actually. You already know my background. 
a gentleman named Justin York, who is a capital markets expert, had taken probably 28, 29 companies public, tremendous uh, resource for us as we were becoming public. Uh, and then, of course, uplisting. Candace Crawford has joined the board uh, about six months ago or so. Now, uh, Candace uh, comes to us from Coca-Cola and basically lives our our um, uh, our business model. She's amazing. She's also the chair of our audit committee, extremely astringent, which is exactly what we want. We all want to sleep at night to know that our filings are accurate to the nickel. Uh, Candace is uh, chair of our audit committee and also on our comm committee. She's fantastic. And we are uh, uh, in discussions and searching for our fifth board member. Uh, it'll, it'll be an independent board member. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, and then uh, uh, from a a not informal advisory position, uh, Pete Carr, who's one of our former Red Bull VPs. Uh, he's president of Bacardi right now. And Jack uh, also uh, was a president of, uh, of uh, Nestle at one point. And you can get a theme here, right? So it's not my first rodeo, as they say. So what we want is a lot of strategics to have a peek under the tent. Uh, so if we want to have a conversation for a particular brand exit, we can. Um, You'll you, you hear me use the word distribution and then usually make the sign of the cross. Um, distribution is everything uh, in beverage, as I mentioned um, earlier. Nobody cares about Anna and Robert's tea uh, that's not on shelf. <clears throat> Why we are uh, very, very proud of this. This is where a lot of beverage companies uh, trip and stutter. Um, we um, have a formal relationship with InBev. Uh, it's a contractual relationship. And InBev, of course, bought um, uh, bought Budweiser, so we are very heavy into the uh, DSD beer system. When I was running Red Bull, um, we were primarily Miller and Coors when they were separate. Didn't have the luxury of all three uh, beer networks. Um, now we do. I gave away, I was able to give away uh, because of the owner of Red Bull, many, many distributorships uh, for free. Uh, so, of course, any of the Miller Coors people uh, that had them, uh, or anyone else for that matter, are quite quite uh, happy to talk to us about what's going on. It's an incredible, luxurious position to have. Most people don't get their phone calls returned um, and they're more than happy to speak to us and Bill. Um, so we're, we're actually in the Bud Network right now, uh, formal relationship with InBev, as I mentioned, but we also have vendor numbers with all the broadliners. Broadliners are the KEs, the UNFIs of the world, McLean's, et cetera. So if a chain retailer says to us, hey, look, you know, we don't wanna go through the beer DSD, which stands for direct store delivery, by the way, if we don't want to go through the beer network, then we can go uh, broadline. Uh, this is a live example. This happened to us actually in Texas. So we immediately shifted gears and we uh, were running with KE to bring a particular brand to a particular retailer. And we have product on shelf in five days. I mentioned our two uh, um, uh, core values of being uh, pre-existing brand awareness and pure innovation. The third unofficial one is execution, execution, execution. A lot of people say these words, but we honor these words and, and we do what we say. We're very proud of that. So we can get product on shelf very quickly. And of course, you know, direct to warehouse works as well. Um, we also happen to have our own B2B and B2C uh, vertical platform for distribution as well. It's like a mini Amazon. We focus on our beverages, but we sell a lot of other things as well. Um, it's a tremendous platform for us, and it has the ability to uh, to really drive a lot of revenue with, with very good margins. Um, the, the, the strategy behind this, the vision behind this is for as uh, uh, state lines crumble, um, we'll be in a position to ship beverage alcohol across state lines. That hasn't happened yet. I want to make sure everybody understands that's very clear. Uh, so right now we're shipping what we can legally within state and across state lines. But this is not the Drizzly model. That Drizzly model is very different. This would be direct to consumer from our warehouse. So uh, if and when that happens, this will be a, a tremendous advantage uh, over our competitors. Because I'm not aware of anybody that our size that even has anything like this, whether it exists or not, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm certainly not aware of it. Uh, so this is a very important thing for us. It also allows us to incubate brands. Um, Prove, a, you know, proof, con prove the concept and then migrate them to traditional distribution. Uh, so it's a really nice platform. Uh, we can do R&D uh, or we can acquire something small and accelerate that, that revenue and then migrate it to traditional distribution. It gives us a vertical approach that's unique um, and, um, and a tremendous place to, to test and prove brands. 
uh, the four brands that Anna mentioned, uh, of course, Tap Out, we have Salt, Naturally Flavored Tequila, Copa de Vino, and Popa Loco. Um, salt, Naturally Flavored Tequila, it's an incredible product. Um, uh, there are three key drivers with the uh, in, in the spirits business right now, and, and it's the tequila category itself is actually driving the, the entire category. In fact, um, uh, it's, it's the highest growth segment within the spirits segment itself. Uh, flavors have been driving have been driving uh, spirits for many many years. Think about what flavors have done for rum and then vodka. Now even today, brown goods, really really cool stuff. Uh, so we're uh, uh, we're playing in a space where really no one has done anything with flavored tequilas before. There have been a few off skews here and there, so, but for the most part, no one's really done it. We have a chocolate, a berry, and a citrus. Uh, they're phenomenal. And most importantly, the quality is there. It's it's 100% agave, and they're 80 proof. That's very difficult to do with the spirit. Generally, when you add a flavor to a spirit, you're adding sugar, and it gets heavier. It's almost like a liqueur. It's sticky. Uh, but this is just the essence of these flavors. You can do incredible amounts of things. I urge you to go to our website and look at some of the recipes. Phenomenal product. Um, uh, uh, well, I spoke I spoke in advance here, so all 100% agave and all three flavors. Um, just some activation that we're doing with this product. Uh, people love it. Uh, we own all the IP and the glass, the, the shape of the bottle, everything. It's all ours. Tap out hydration recovery product. Most of you uh, probably remember tap out from the UFC days. Uh, remember, I keep talking about pre existing brand awareness. Tap out's been around, whoop, pardon me, tap out's been around for, um, there we go. Tap out's been around for about 24 years. Uh, so there's tons of pre existing brand awareness, a lot of eyeballs on the product. Um, we've, um, uh, we've actually just launched a fourth SKU. It's a, a mango peach it's outstanding it's selling exceptionally well uh, but it's an amazing product again not because it's ours uh, but it's a better mouse trap um, you're, we're competing in the gatorade powerade and now body armor segment and we believe will be the fourth leg to that table uh, but it's all five electrolytes and we're all natural uh, which is a, a, a unique uh, to tap out only so we'll be able to play in the natural food space as well uh, we're in front of those chains as we speak Highly efficacious and it tastes good. Very difficult to mask all those nutrients. Did it's an incredible product and it's for sale in a lot of major retailers already uh, across the state of Florida, across the south of the southern United States. We're in Walmart stores, uh, uh, et cetera. So it's product selling very well. We're very very excited about it. We believe it will be the fourth leg of that table. Um, we pr produce this product with the white space in mind, meaning, you know, Gatorade, American iconic brand. I mean, you can't beat, you know, can't, you can't knock Gatorade, right? Um, you could argue their ingredients aren't necessarily with what's on trend with consumer, uh, but the brand itself, you know, six, seven billion dollars, Powerade, same thing. So it's strong, iconic value, but, but nothing in the premium price segment. We want to exist in the premium price segment. We are price premium to these guys. Uh, intentionally. When we were building out Red Bull, uh, the price was higher than what people would expect. We, we lost that product at $2. It was price premium to everything, anything else out there. In fact, it's even more expensive today. So um, it becomes aspirational. And we even put the label in English and in Spanish uh, because of the huge connection to Hispanic um, fighters and then hand to mouth workers as well. So it's it's a very, very clear strategy <clears throat> and we're quite proud of it. Uh, it's working quite, quite well. Um, here's a little, uh, here are a little bit of uh, 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 examples of execution out in the marketplace. I believe these are Walmart stores. Um, and then on to Copa de Vino. Copa de Vino was our first acquisition. Uh, we bought it from a gentleman named James Martin. Uh, James, we call it the Shark Tank brand because James went on, on television uh, twice, didn't take the money. Uh, it's great for us because we have a, um, uh, a built-in free marketing platform. The producers of that show play those play those episodes. Uh, gosh, every you know every other week. So it's uh, people do call it the Shark Tank brand. But it was the innovator in the single serve wine business, which has become huge. Copa de Vino was first. We have seven seven varieties of it. Uh, the packaging is as ours. It's exclusive. We own it. Um, and uh, we primarily distribute it through the Bud, uh, Budweiser network as well. Um, uh, <clears throat> and when we consider acquisition, um, we're really, um, really focused on how 
the brand plays in the back end of the business as well as the front end of the business. So the segment itself, uh, really on fire. There's tons of single serve wine now. In fact, we just got this product about two months ago, I think, in uh, Dodger Stadium, along with Popoloco, <clears throat> uh, flying out of that out of that venue, and uh, we're focused on. Uh, I think actually, uh, we'll we'll send an announcement out. We have other uh, large venues now selling the product, but but acquisition strategy for us is really important. Uh, the route to market, the dis distribution synergies. Uh, retail synergies, production synergies. Uh, so we really uh, did a hard analysis on this on this brand, and and the brand, frankly, um, uh, was capital starved. And I've said this publicly, and it's in our filings actually. But our um, our volume is about almost four x of when we purchased it a year and a half ago. So the brand is doing extremely well. We're uh, 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 quite excited about it. Um, it came with a brand called Popoloco. It's an import out of Madrid. Um, there's a TV show out there called Storage Wars. I, I think you buy a storage unit and you get some, hopefully there's some something of value in there. Uh, Popoloco was our, our storage war, uh, unit uh, wars prize. Uh, it's a phenomenal product. Um, it's a lovely sangria. It's 5.5 APV alcohol by volume product, so we can sell it almost everywhere. Um, and it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a fifth generation, I think, recipe from the, the owner uh, in Madrid and his wife. Uh, we did announce recently that we're buying 80% of Popo Loco, and we'll hope to close that up here in the next uh, 30 or 60 days. Uh, but the brand is really tracking well. The real excitement here, um, besides the fact that it's just a lovely product, um, it's it's this package. Um, with it came the right to uh, what's called Cartican. We have the exclusive rights in this country, and we'll be expanding those rights uh, when we close the acquisition. Um, uh, for Cartican, it's the we as far as I know, it's the only biodegradable can in the United States. It's tons of recyclable stuff, um, but this is the only biodegradable. It's 96% biodegradable. <clears throat> we um, um, we really believe heavily uh, at this organization and the sustainability story and the importance of the environment. Um, you know, we want to leave the planet to our kids someday, right? So um, uh, we're excited about this, and we'll have the ability to put other uh, uh, other SKUs of our brands into this package, and and uh, as we uh, as we expand the use of this can, so very very important um, acquisition for us. And this this came we didn't even know it. That was the storage war portion of the story. So um, we uh, love this little brand, uh, and you'll see uh, more and more announcements as we um, uh, as as the the year goes on. Uh, I think the most recent was Ralph's in Southern, uh, excuse me, throughout the state of California, which is a Kroger chain. Uh, carrying the product, and there are others as well. So very important uh, acquisition, and the rights to this can, we believe, are extremely valuable. Um, all right, just to sum this up, <clears throat> basically you've got brands that are on trend with consumers, very important. We're not trying to pet the fur of the wrong direction, as they say. Uh, we have the right board and the right people, which is always critical. We have the right liquid and the right packaging, uh, and uh, having access to public capital, uh, for acquisition as we move forward, critically important. Um, and again, our core values, pre-existing brand awareness and innovation and execute, execute, execute. Um, I apologize again for my voice. I don't know what's going on. Uh, Anna, I'll turn it back to you. Maybe I can clear my throat here. Take your time, drink some water. It's all good. <laughs> I understand, Robert. Okay, I like the idea of the Robert Anna tea. Uh, maybe we can call it the <laughs> Anna Berry, a berry flavor. Oh, oh I like it. <laughs> okay, great presentation. You've got some really nice products here. Uh, we've got tons of questions from our audience. Uh, let's start in. Uh, David Figueredo, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, he wants to know if you could explain in detail the potential of the biodegradable can for the beverages. Do you have rights globally? or just North America? And how are you gonna maximize its potential? Yeah, great question. Uh, love talking about it. It's an incredibly valuable asset. Um, uh, for the, the second half of the question, David, we are, uh, we right now we have the rights for the, uh, for the United States. Uh, since we announced we'll be purchasing Popoloco, uh, that will expand our exclusive rights throughout uh, the Americas. Um, there's a group in Europe that already has European rights, and they've, the can has been very successful, by the way. It's just great. sold four or five billion units, I think, uh, in Europe. So 
um, our plan now will be to, um, we're importing that can right now from Europe. Our plan will be to partner with Carta Can and start producing those cans here in the Americas. Um, I've said this publicly, so this is not forward looking. Uh, our intention, our vision will be to start in the United States and then have another uh, canning uh, facility in Mexico and one in South America. Uh, the final vision there is to obviously, uh, uh, the, the, oh, by the way, there's tremendous impact to, to cost of goods sold to COGS here. Um, aluminum is very expensive today. Um, uh, even with our relationships, you know, we'd be paying 20, 25, 30 cents for a can of aluminum. Right now, before we produce in the United States, without the liquid, this can is landing here in the U.S. at eight cents. If we produce it here, we think we can get that down to about four or five cents. So it has a tremendous positive impact to cost of goods sold and our finished goods. Uh, and then if we have excess capacity, we'll sell that excess capacity uh, to, uh, to other brands. So we believe it's going to be a nice profit center for us. Great. John McNamara says, impressive string of distribution announcements, but can you tell us if you've seen the impact yet in reported numbers? And if not, when can investors expect to see the impact in those numbers? Yeah, another great question. Um, <clears throat> anybody who's familiar with the beverage space, um, there, there's it's brick and mortar. It takes a little bit of time. Um, we had a record quarter in Q1. Um, I don't see why that won't continue throughout the year. Not forward looking, just to just my own feeling. Um, it takes uh, <clears throat> the, the physical mechanics of launching a distributor. Um, there's, a, there's a great deal of time. So you, may, you, have, to, you have to negotiate the contract. Uh, then, you, then you agree to it. You move forward. You start thinking about, they start thinking about placing an order. They have to move product around in the warehouse. Then we have to schedule a sales meeting. Then we have to call on the regional chains in the area. There's about a, about a, three to six month lag between actual revenue uh, when you make those announcements. So while we had a record quarter last last quarter, um, you'll start seeing the acceleration of that impact throughout the year and certainly into the first of next year. But it's it's critical that you set this stuff up um, because um, it, that's our route to market. So it just, it just takes three to six months before you see the impact. Okay. David Oliver says, year after year, your assets are up about 25%. Liabilities are down about 12%, and sales have doubled. Yet the stock is down about 30%. So talk about any milestones investors should look for that could propel the stock higher. Yeah, um, so the overall statement here is we believe we're, we're undervalued. Um, uh, uh, yes, we're still a small company. Yes, we're still growing. Yes, we're adding distribution. Um, you know, as from a milestone standpoint, anytime we, we add distribution or add a retail announcement, it's straight up revenue. And the good news, I also want to make sure people understand this. When we, when we have a, a distribution agreement with a bud distributor somewhere, that's our customer. It's not consignment. Um, there's basically a 30 day AR cycle. So we announce that and they buy product, they pay for it in 30 days. And these are a plus credit uh, uh, credit risks, right? So we don't have any, we've had no AR, knock on wood, AR issues whatsoever. So milestones really are larger distribution and more chains. Um, uh, just 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 stick with us, folks. Um, you know, we have to set this foundation up for growth. And then also, I mentioned acquisition a few times, um, we're constantly evaluating targets. Um, know that that's going on behind the scenes. We're always evaluating you know, two, four, eight targets at any time. We've passed on a lot. Um, so acquisition, dis distribution announcements, and retail partnership announcements. Uh, those are kind of the three gating items I think you should keep your eyes out for. Sounds good. Stephen Jefferson wants to know, um, what is your Arizona distribution extension due to your sales on a percentage basis? Yeah, um, so Khalil Bottling, uh, which is cured Dr. Pepper's, I think, largest or maybe second largest distributor bottler, has done an amazing job. Um, they had 119 Walmarts. I think they loaded them in, I want to say, about a week and a half. Uh, they, we've also uh, uh, loaded the largest of the number one ACV, meaning uh, highest foot traffic grocery chain uh, called Bashes in Food City. They loaded those in about two weeks. 
Uh, they we made an announcement a couple of days ago. They're hitting all the regional um, smaller C store chains. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job. They're uh, they're also uh, exist outside of Arizona. They're in Colorado, New Mexico, and I think El Paso. Um, they're uh, I believe they're on their fifth or sixth truckload. And but the most important thing uh, is their repeat purchase. Um, so we have we're experiencing repeat sales in every one of those accounts. So that's very very important. Uh, with, with respect to brand health, and that will be um, uh, replicated throughout the country. From a percentage standpoint, uh, I don't have that number in front of me, but um, they're doing a great job. Um, but uh, all of our distributors are experiencing repeat sales, which is really very, very important. That's the holy grail here in our in our space. Great. Susan Harvey wants you to discuss more about your plan to grow geographically, and if so, where? Also discuss growth in your product line. Yeah, um, I'll start with um, uh, geographic growth, Susan. Um, yeah, we, as we, uh, I have to be so careful because, uh, you know, we're public. Um, <clears throat> as we're in front of the chains, uh, every chain has their own footprint, right? Um, so when we announce, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. As we announce a new chain, um, we'll, we will expand within that footprint. So that's as detailed as I can answer that question without giving you guys something uh, I'm not supposed to say that's public. Um, it's not public. Uh, so watch for chain announcements, watch for distribution announcements. Um, you know, we want to be coast to coast. We want to have uh, arms reach availability. Um, that's very important to us. And then uh, the second half of the announcement, we just launched our fourth SKU for tap out, uh, which is peach mango. It's flying. Uh, it's done doing very, very well. Um, um, I frankly, <laughs> it was Bill Meisner who, who, who drove that flavor. And I'm like, Bill, peach mango. He's like, yeah, yeah trust me. And boy, he was right. Tastes fantastic. Um, and then, uh, with Copa Divina, we already have seven flavors. I don't anticipate any, uh, expansion of there just yet until, uh, we're launching four packs when we've talked about that publicly. So, uh, we should see some action on that with the chains as well, uh, as, as the year progresses on. Uh, with salt tequila, we've actually had a, um, a request from one of our uh, one of the larger um, retail uh, off-premise partners. Uh, it's part of a grocery chain. I'll leave the name out. And the buyer there, she actually asked if we would do a silver, a straight up 100% agave silver, unflavored. Uh, we've developed it, but we haven't bottled it yet. And, and again, I can say this out loud. We've talked about it. Um, we're evaluating how that fits into the portfolio as we speak, and it could help us on premise in the bar, restaurant, and hotel segment. Uh, it might actually help us uh, have ex exclusivity in certain chains. So we're exploring that option. Uh, nothing's been decided upon yet, uh, but we're always looking for uh, uh, expansion where it makes sense. We don't want to just to expand to expand. The worst thing you can do is have you know 15 SKUs and have you know three of them be 80 percent of your volume. So we're sensitive to that. It's, uh, it's taxing on the organization and on your on your cash flow. Maxine Price uh, is talking about in regards to your acquisitions, what do you look to pay on a price to sales ratio? And what do you look for specifically in an acquisition candidate? Yeah, wow, that's such an important question. Um, you know, that the typical top line multiples, you know, like I said early on in the presentation tend to be anywhere you know, I've seen them as low as three, as high as George Clooney with Casamigos at 20. Good average is, is five to seven turns. Um, if you uh, stay in that range and the brand itself has a lot of upside, for example, if we were to evaluate, evaluate a target and it's a regional brand, you know, it exists in, um, you know, say the, I'm just making this up, in the Southeast United States, great same store sales then you can expect to replicate that throughout the country. So um, you'll pay, um, you know, you'll pay the, let's, let's just pick a number, you'll pay five times top line for that. But as you expand that in the rest of the, in the rest of the United States, all of a sudden your revenue triples, quadruples. And because the brand has proven itself, you might get a premium. You might be able to sell that down the line for say six or seven times, depending on the M&A environment. There's actually been a compression in multiples right now. Uh, it's uh, it's a really a buyer's market, so we're really keenly evaluating a lot of different targets. Um, but 
you know, and then, then there's other, there are other factors. You might have, there might be a celebrity brand out there. I keep talking about George Clooney. Um, if there's a celebrity in there involved and it's the right celebrity, not every celebrity brand works. That's very important. People need to understand that. Uh, George Clooney has a what's a, called a Q score, very high Q score. It's a likability rating, kind of like Cary Grant back, you know, before I was even born. Um, huge, huge, high Q score. That's why that works. So you might get a premium if there's a celebrity involved and then you expand distribution, you get maybe you bought it at four times top line and now you're selling it at six or seven times top line on top of a much higher revenue number. So that's how the numbers work and that's why it's exciting. And that's why our InBev relationship and our pre-existing relationships with all the other distributors out there is so incredibly valuable. We believe we have a plug and play scenario. We buy a brand, we can plug it into our distribution network or simply expand it with our distribution network. And we are, we're faster to increase revenue, faster to increase multiple, say we decide to exit that brand down the line. And some brands we wanna keep. Um, I'll tell you, I'm not saying we're gonna keep salt tequila, but our margins are very high on salt tequila. We, we expand distribution on salt. We may not we may not want to sell it, and especially if the M&A environment is like it is today. So it's really a buyer's market, and that'll flip. It does all the time. This, this is a very common thing that's been going on for 40 years. So uh, I, I hope I've answered your question, but there are a lot of considerations. Oh, and then the other half of your question, the, the back end of the business. It's very important that everything plays nice in the sandbox. So we, we like to buy um, uh, labels from the same people, cardboard from the same people. We're very fortunate our distribution networks line up and we can leverage our same distribution network. So it's a very efficient look at the business um, uh, when we're evaluating a target. Um, how will it add efficiencies and how will it increase our buying power to ratchet down raw material costs? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of variables. It's all up on a big whiteboard. <laughs> there are a lot of variables in it. Great, great answer to that question. Uh, Roger Lockhart and Danielle Hinte want to know, what type of reorders are you seeing? Yeah, uh, our reorder, uh, same store sales, we call it, or you know, reorder business is very, very healthy. Um, I can say this because uh, Walmart publishes these numbers. Uh, they give them out. <clears throat> um, I don't have the most recent ones, but from the period of two weeks for the prior two weeks of the last report, we were actually up in same store sales uh, 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 just over 40%. Um, and that's really incredible. I don't, that, that's not sustainable, um, but we're experiencing some really, really fan, uh, fantastic numbers like that in certain locations. Um, everything else is, uh, is proven itself and re repeat sales are fantastic. I mentioned on Copa de Vino before, um, when we purchased the, comp the brand, there's nothing wrong with it. It was just capital starved and it's in, the, it's in our uh, Q1 numbers. Uh, but we really almost 4X the number already in, in less than a year. So same store sales, very healthy. Um, and that's why we're uh, bullish on expanding as quickly as we can. A follow-up question from Daniel. Any other sports stadiums distribution coming along? Yes. <laughs> Again, <laughs> have to be careful what I say, but that's a, uh, an important target for us. Uh, you know what I can say? I'll say it this way. Uh, we have uh, just in um, we've just uh, engaged in a uh, an incentive for our distributors to open additional large venues like that, uh, and a lot of the a lot of the large venues had Copa de Vino uh, back in the day. So uh, we're just reinvigorating it. But we're not, oh we're also in Madison Square Garden. We've been there for uh, I think actually when we bought the brand. So uh, so we're in you know, key East Coast, key West Coast, and we have a lot of targets with an incentive in place right now. Fantastic. Nicole Craig wants to you to talk about your white label business. Do you have any? And are you packaging for other brands? Uh, not right now. It's interesting you bring that up, though. We've, we've had a couple of inquiries recently about that, um, and we uh, will consider it. Um, it, it, it. We're first and foremost concerned about our own brand and our brand uh, DNA. Um, but if we can bottle for someone else uh, while we're bottling our own and it doesn't create any production issues uh, and it's and it's easy, it's like contract manufacturing, uh, they send you a check and you send them the product. So uh, we will absolutely do it um, in the right scenario, but our brands are our family, our children. Uh, we're gonna protect those first 
uh, but we will do it if it's uh, if it doesn't get in the way. Tony Rivera says, congratulations on the growth. Uh, a few questions from Tony. He wants you to detail any revenue you receive that is not selling or distributing beverages. Thank you, Tony. Um, no, uh, we're, we're a beverage company. Um, that's what we do and that's who we are. And, you know, it's nice as you get older, it's, you know what you don't know and it's okay. <laughs> um, what we know is, 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 is beverage and we're going to stick with that. He, he asked a few questions about white label bottling for other brands, which you just answered. If you want to follow up with that at all, uh, his other question is what else can you do to grow value for investors? Yeah, um, as it, 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 we believe it will happen naturally as as we have more economies of scale and more efficiencies, margins increase, bottom lines increase, EBITDA increases. <clears throat> that's really it. We, we believe the capital markets will catch up with us. I'm not suggesting um, we uh, are anything like Celsius, although we do play in the same space. I mean, look at Celsius. I mean, that that's an incredibly... Um, high value organization, it, 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 it fluctuates like everybody, but uh, there's no reason why we can't continue to add shareholder value through performance. That's the key. We have our eyeball on, on share price all the time. It's, that's my job. And believe me, I'm, I'm a shareholder here, a large shareholder. I have a lot of money in Splash myself. Um, so understand everyone listening that uh, we're all, <clears throat> we're all on the same team here. Um, but we also, um, but I'm also really disciplined when it comes to company and brand performance. If we keep our heads down and we execute and we do our jobs right, eventually the capital markets will catch up. It's brick and mortar. I'm asking everybody to, who's supporting us to this point, we, we thank you so very, very much. Just, just continue to support and be patient. Um, and, um, and the company is well on its way, and we believe that that base performance of the company will ultimately add shareholder value. Great answer. Daniel Hinte also wants to know if you have any more institutional support. Um, <clears throat> uh, as we evaluate acquisition targets, um, large and small, um, those generally historically uh, would come with large institutional support. Uh, so right now, yeah, we have some, some medium-sized institutions that are buy and hold. Um, and this, this sort of goes back into the last question as well for both of you. Um, Obviously, um, our, our objective for new shareholders or our current shareholders is buy and hold. I'm, I'm not selling a share. Uh, I can look you dead in the eye. In fact, I even you can see our Form 4s. I even bought more shares uh, last month. So um, and we filed Form 4s for all of them. But, but buy and hold is really important to us, and large institutions do that. Um, so as we evaluate acquisition targets, um, you'll see uh, if, if, in fact, we do that, if, 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 right? Um, nothing forward looking here, but uh, assuming that happens, these are these are groups that will definitely buy and hold. They, they have a long-term view of what we're doing. They understand that Splash is a platform for growth. Um, if you just look at our numbers right now, we're small, we're growing, it's great, it's exciting, but the vision is acquisition and, and legacy brand growth. And if we do both those things together, our margins will go up, and our revenues will go up, and ultimately our, our GP will go up. So uh, we're in the middle of that right now. So everybody, if, if you can, we just appreciate you so much. Buy and hold is our is our objective with institutions. Jake Barber asks if you've considered selling any apparel for any of your brands. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. So um, there's a there's someone with tap out that has the a, a, an apparel license. So, but they don't they don't sell the beverage. They just sell the core brand of tap out. In fact, the yoga clothing is doing really well. Interesting question. And I'm getting I'll get to the answer. Uh, but the licensing uh, uh, group that that has the the apparel, you know, we're trying to build a lifestyle brand here. We're all things consumable. They have yoga clothing, men's clothing. Um, there's some light equipment and stuff. Uh, think of us as kind of with tap out. It's kind of a mini. Um, Under Armour, if you will. Uh, so we're trying to build out a lifestyle brand. But with respect to the brands themselves and the bottles on T-shirts and things like that, um, we, 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 we give them away as, as promotional items for now. But at some point, um, if there's a, some communication that makes sense to actually sell, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, but it's not a normal thing to do in beverage. 
All right. Well, this has been a fantastic presentation. You've been in this industry for a while and you guys have some great products there. Do you have anything to say for closing remarks, Robert? No, I just want to thank all of our shareholders very, very much. We appreciate you all. And um, we, uh, uh, we are laser focused on adding shareholder value. Um, it's happening and it's going to continue to happen over time. And just sit back and watch and let us, let us do our, let us run. Great. Well, you definitely got my mouth watering. I want to try some of your products, so send them over. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Come join us again in the future with some updates. Thank you for being on our conference today. Thank you, Anna. We appreciate the opportunity. Okay, to all of our viewers watching, we're going to take a quick break. We will be back with RYU Apparel Inc. at 1245 Eastern. We'll see you soon.